Jeremy, I just want to pick it up um, in, in terms of the supply deficit globally that we're seeing of, of, of oil. And, and we can also, of course, add in maybe not gas. I'm not sure. Um, but the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, you, you started out by saying we have a multi-year um, investment horizon, it sounds like, for owning oil and oil stocks. But, um, you know, it, it probably surprises a lot of people. I don't think that's been the narrative. I think we always think that Saudi Arabia has plenty of oil. Can you give us a, a bit more detail in terms of whether they do or they don't? Yeah, and I think that's a bit open for debate here. You will have all walks of different investment communities say, you know, they can produce more than 11. You know, there's no history of them producing more than 11. If you look at why they're not making up for the shortfall for some of these other countries, um, why aren't they? And I think that's a lot of speculation on you know, do they really do have the capacity or not? And you see that with a lot of the other countries in terms of here's your quotas and you guys, these countries haven't met those quotas for quite some time. And I think that's what's putting a little bit more doubt in terms of, you know, is, is there really the spare capacity that is expected out there? And you're starting to see more and more uh, research come out that suggests that, you know what, maybe they don't. And unfortunately, the way you only find out is if prices suddenly spike and that production doesn't come on. But in the meantime, you do have those spikes. There's probably more risk to the upside in terms of commodity prices, or in terms of crude oil prices going up versus versus going down here, just given that uh, that margin of error that we're looking at spare capacity now. And again, just keeping our eyes on the supply side because that's key and critical, and that's the reason the lack of supply is why we're seeing WTI over 110 bucks. But um, wh what about the U.S. shale players? What, what's the ability for them to come back online? Yeah, so this is, you know, one of the biggest reasons over the last 10 years here why oil prices have been, you know, relatively comfortable range in that 50, 60, 70 dollar range here. And it was because U.S. shale was able to make up any shortfall that OPEC had uh, very quickly. And um, the problem that we have now, though, is a real shareholder activism that says we need to see start seeing some profits here. And there's a lot of struggle that says instead of seeing you guys grow more we want to see a return of capital and a lot of the management compensation packages now have been restructured so they're rewarded not on growth but more on free cash flow uh more on returns and the thing that really helps returns is if you don't grow if you're not expanding new pipelines in that so management have an incentive to um really just kind of pay bigger dividends and buy back stock um, but the other issue, though, that's going on is you really just do have a lack of supply um, and, and, and labor here, um, you know, to try and get an additional rig, um, to get the steel for that rig to drill, uh, just given kind of the inflationary problems uh, and just finding good qualified, you know, rig hands here because, uh, you know, it goes back to that narrative of peak oil. Typically, rig hands are a younger generation. And if you're trying to entice someone to come and work on the rigs, and they're looking at a 40 year career and they're saying, I'm not quite sure oil is going to be around here in 40 years. Why do I want to come do that as a career? So you you really are running into a lot of logistical issues trying to get new rigs to work here here as well, too, for the shale play. Um, when, when we think about Canada's role in the uh, global oil story and or supply side, um, and, and when we think of our friends uh, south of our border, and the need that they really do have um, to combat their high oil prices. Where does Canada fit into that? You know what, As I think the, uh, you know, we, we, we've been really focused on the ESG of Canadian oil here, you know, just really focusing on the environment, the social, the governance. But I think there needs to be another S added to that ESG, meaning security here that we really haven't talked about quite, a, quite nearly as often as we probably should be here. And, Unfortunately, just given our egress and pipelines out of Canada, we don't really have the ability to help out, you know, our, our U.S. friends and, and anybody overseas here. Just, you know, there's marginal supply that we could probably increase production by about 5% here. But, um, you know, we really are limited in terms of what we can really do on a world stage here now. Is that um, a missed opportunity? I, I, I think very certain it's a missed opportunity. And I think it depends on which side of the aisle you're looking at here. But if we're looking for, um, you know, who's going to supply the marginal source of oil to, you know, a country in Asia here, is it going to be Saudi Arabia or should it be Canada? And I think 
there would be a lot of people who would say, well, it should be Canada, but um, you know, this, these are the debates that, that we have here. And, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to have those conversations.